It was his line where he talked about how the technological changes that are happening, especially in things like communication, might make the nation state as we know it, you know, countries superfluous, certainly the very large ones. He talked about how, and I really don't want to put any words into his mouth. Um, you can go to the website, get that interview if you want. Um, but he was kind of saying that a lot of the things that used to make it advantageous to be a big, you know, giant state were being made superfluous or sometimes even drawbacks in an era where you didn't need all that, that modern technology and communications made it possible to do a lot of the things you needed that size to do. You could basically turn Tennessee, I think he said, maybe into its own country with its own trade policy, its own foreign policy, and ability to take care of its own stuff. Now, I thought about that again when I was thinking about this story, this sort of you know five, six, seven things I've cut out of the newspaper that are related to this subject at hand. And I thought to myself, all of a sudden, a new thought based on that axis, that hub that James Burke laid down in the program that keeps me thinking. How do you think the United States government would react to Tennessee deciding that it didn't need to be part of a nation state anymore? How do you think China would react to one of those Uyghur provinces or something in the West deciding it didn't really need to be a part of China anymore? It could be self-sufficient. I think you see where I'm going with this. There's some interesting internal contradictions, maybe we should call them, happening right now that are being you know, brought to a head by the level and pace of technological change, specifically as it regards communications technology, that may be at the point now that the 1960s were at in like 1966, where you can see it happening. And then by 1967, 68, boom, it's here. I'm not saying it's happening that fast. This is going to be a slower playing out process. But I think we're starting to see the internal contradictions between what the nation state can handle and what the technology is allowing us to do come to a head. Let me go back and start with the story. Once again, I'm afraid I might have talked about before. When you've done more than 200 of these things and you can't remember what you had for dinner last night, I think it is amazing that we don't just say the same thing every show anyway and not know it. But that having been said, as basically an apology to you, I'm sorry, um, I had a conversation once that I've never forgotten with an expert on Eastern Europe. And the conversation was years ago, back in the era, middle 1990s, early 1990s, when the whole breakup of the former Yugoslavia was happening and the troubles that were going on in the Balkans were occurring. And so the conversation was set up to talk about that. But because Russia historically always had such an important role in that region, we naturally got into a discussion about that, especially since the Soviet Union incarnation of the Russian system and state had just recently broken up. You know, this is a major geopolitical uh, collapse that impacted everything. And, you know, it was his point of view that it impacted this Balkan thing a lot. So we started talking about that. And I asked him about the traditional American narrative that has kind of taken hold. It's, it's not really, you know, 60, I'll say 60% of the people buy it. It's always been kind of more of a political thing, something to give a particular piece of credit to Ronald Reagan for in the Cold War. The American idea that the reason the Soviet Union fell was because we started an arms race, including things like Star Wars, which the Soviet Union couldn't match because their system economically was dried up and they didn't have the money and it bankrupted them. This was a conscious strategy on the part of the Reagan administration to you know, see a, a Soviet Union that couldn't handle the raising of the stakes and then to raise them and boom, they're busted. And this expert on Eastern European affairs and government laughed. He said, yes, that's the narrative. He goes, but anybody who watches this stuff understands that the internal contradictions in the Soviet Union were going to force it you know, into one of a couple of directions. And the direction it chose didn't allow it to continue to exist anymore. It disintegrated it, essentially. He said the Soviet Union was an early to mid 20th century style police state. In order for it to remain a first world, the superpower, along with the United States, it was forced to make choices in terms of technology and communications, which it didn't want to make because it couldn't maintain its middle 20th century style police state in a more open world that fostered more communication between people. Militarily, the Soviet Union couldn't keep up with where the West was going without developing, you know, the communications technology that was revolutionizing warfare, the kind of stuff that's um, talked about in Alvin and Heidi Toffler's book, War and Anti-War. 
this whole revolution that was occurring in the late 70s, early 80s, where the United States was turning into a communication oriented um, direction that would revolutionize battlefield warfare. And the Soviet Union couldn't go there because to go there meant, you know, they couldn't confine this technological communication and development to just the military sphere. They were going to have to let it loose in their society. And their society was so tightly controlled that that would have destroyed the society. My stepfather's prescription of how you defeat the Soviet Union comes to mind, where he always said during the Cold War, we were fighting it the wrong way. He said, these people don't want to live like this. They may not know they don't want to live like this. You just send a bunch of bombers overhead and you drop Levi's jeans, Playboy magazines and rock and roll records on these people and they will overthrow that government themselves. It's why police states like the Soviet Union were always so keen to keep their own people from being tainted by Western influences and decadence, right? Just having contact with some American sailors during the Second World War at a Soviet port would be enough to get you deported. You've been corrupted by Western imperialist values and decadence. Those kind of states don't like communication. It's why you have like one newspaper, sometimes two. You have Pravda. And if you don't like Pravda, you have Investia. I mean, you have the government's official line. And if you start a newspaper of your own, you're going to be arrested because that's illegal, because that's a threat in a state that's that tightly controlled. So as technology and communication moved into an era where if you want to keep up with the Joneses and you want to be part of the first world and not a North Korea who chooses to be a police state, makes that choice and just realizes you can't be a police state and a superpower. You're going to be off in Gilligan's Island land on the side of the world and have no lights showing up on the satellite images of you. You know, when they're taken because you have no technology. Fine. You'd be a police state. The Soviet Union wasn't going to make that choice. They were a, a superpower. They tried Glasnost. Remember that? Glasnost was the Soviet attempt to have their cake and eat it, too, when it came to being a police state. Can we still be a police state, but open up enough to get the values of all this soon to be 21st century technology that's coming down the pike? They were walking a very fine line, though, with captive populations in the Warsaw Pact and everybody, and, and they fell off the fine line. It was a tightrope walk to see if they could manage it, and they didn't manage it, and the whole thing just imploded. But this expert basically said that it was on the verge of imploding for a long time. The fact that you reached a fork in the road and had to either open up or die killed that police state. Now, you can look at China today as potentially a better example of a formerly closed communistic police state deciding to try to have a soft landing. Because that's what they were. They were every bit and more closed than the Soviet Union used to be. They took a, a different road to figuring out a way to tie itself into the grid enough so that it can be a part of the world in the 21st century, but not so much that it totally had to turn into, you know, France. Revolutionary France. I mean, you know, it didn't have to really be a democracy, but it's not the closed society it was. So it's it's trying to sort of put their balance between communication and state authority, you know, at a, at, at a lower level than we here in the West would certainly find acceptable. Right. To us, China is still a repressive, one party, non-democratic state and all those kind of things. It's trying to evolve enough to be flexible enough to incorporate, you know, the new world coming in. Now, for a long time, it's easy for us here in the West to laugh at the Soviet Union's problem. Serves them right. You don't give your people the freedom to talk to each other and communicate and have the rights to have free discussions and ideas and print books and all that stuff. This is what you get. You deny human freedom long enough and you reap the rewards, right? But now we're at an interesting point. The technology is exponentially better in terms of communication and all that stuff than the level of openness that brought down these mid 20th century style police states. They're at a point now where they threaten the free and open democratic countries here in, you know, France and Britain and the United States and Australia and Canada and all these places. All of a sudden, this is a level of openness we're not that comfortable with either. It gets me back to the James Burke idea where if you want to look at it a different way, he had a benign sort of twist on it. Like Tennessee, if they wanted to, could just go their own way and everybody be happy with that. There's another way to look at it. It's that hub. It just the James Burke idea sends me in a different direction. You could look at it that this is going to be a huge 
remarkably destabilizing force, this communications technology. And we've already seen it, haven't we, in the whole Middle East and the role it played in the Arab Spring and all that stuff. That's just a first taste. We're in the Model T stage of this whole communications revolution, folks. Don't fall for any idea that we're somehow reaching a plateau. This is the very beginning. And look at the strains it's putting on the systems that we inherited from earlier ages. Case in point, the nation state. That's hundreds of years old. You know that, right? Countries haven't always existed. The modern nation state system traditionally dates back to the Peace of Westphalia in the 1600s, where certain prerogatives were laid down and who the highest authority was and what the relationships were. I mean, France was basically a nation state before the Peace of Westphalia. It just codified something that was already, you know, seeing the most forward nations evolve that way. But before that, there were kingdoms, there were duchies, there were empires, there were other systems that, for all intents and purposes in our discussion here, are the same kinds of systems. Developed in a period where people were able to control communication much more rigidly than they are now. If you go back and look at what some of the things that were most feared in, say, the autocratic era in Europe where kings ruled everything, kings of the church ruled everything, they couldn't stand things like newspapers. Couldn't stand them. I mean, these are death penalties in some places. It's one of the reasons that the freedom of the press thing in the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment is so big. Because at the time, this was essentially putting a line on the ground saying it's the people that control this country and nobody's going to silence the newspapers because silencing the newspapers was the favorite thing for all these kings to do. Because the newspapers, if you let them get out of hand, start saying bad things about this policy or the way the government's going or they start talking to each other about, you know, let, let, let the people talk about sedition. That's why you only have one or two choices in the Soviet Union. The state wants to control the narrative as much as possible. So... You put like a First Amendment into our Constitution and we love newspapers and the British love newspapers and all these Western democracies and places that emulate us love newspapers. But you can see, folks, how that still provides a way to control the narrative. It still provides a break on everybody communicating with everyone else. I mean, you want to talk to your neighbors. You need to write a letter to the editor in the old days to the newspaper. And if they like it, they'll print it. And then if someone wants to respond to you, they'll write a letter back to the editor. And the editor will look at it and decide if they want to print it or not. At no time are you allowed to broadcast to your neighbor who's allowed to broadcast to you. And at the same time, everyone else. All of a sudden, we're reaching a level of communication that threatens our own open, free, democratic governments. And the stories that I cut out from my newspaper are all about that. Um, I have one from, from China. So this isn't about the free Western democracies. But the one from China involves um, a uh, rumor online about a coup in China that has freaked the Chinese government out. And once again, what it's starting to show is what happens when you don't have to write a letter to the editor to get your views broadcast. You can just throw it out there and so can other people. And how much this puts a pinch and strains these national systems based on a certain level of control on information and communication. This is from the Los Angeles Times, Sunday, April 1st, 2012. Dateline Beijing, by the way. Quote, China has launched an Internet crackdown amid its worst political crisis in decades, shuttering more than a dozen websites, limiting access to the country's largest microblog providers, and arresting six people for spreading rumors about a coup attempt in Beijing. From later in the piece, quote, Cinecorp and Tencent Holdings Limited, provider of China's wildly popular Twitter-like services, said they were halting users' abilities to comment on posts until Tuesday morning to quote-unquote clean up what they describe as quote harmful messages, end quote. The story continues. Microblog users deemed to have posted offending content have had their accounts frozen in the past, but the latest moves are the most severe in the ongoing struggle to control social media, considered one of the biggest challenges to the government's authority, end quote. What's happening to China now, it seems to me, you know, there's something happening here, but what it is ain't exactly clear, is that they're reaching a moment where their compromise that they made that allowed them to kind of pull glasnost off the correct way is reaching a tipping point because the communications technology is just getting so advanced. You know, the Soviet Union was taken down by, you know, cell phones and Internet. China's having a really hard time with this social networking. 
the more restrictive and controlling the society is, the earlier it feels the pinch of all this ability for the people to discuss things with each other in ways that, you know, create sedition is the way, unrest and sedition is the way the Founding Fathers era would have discussed it.